they're going to have free fluid if they're an acute abdomen. So how do we figure out if they have a, a, a free fluid and how do we obtain that fluid? And then once we get that fluid, what do we do with it? So how do we diagnose these patients? Well, a lot of times, again, they're going to have free fluid if they're an acute abdomen. So how do we figure out if they have a, a, a free fluid and how do we obtain that fluid? And then once we get that fluid, what do we do with it? Um, how do we diagnose what's going on in our patients? So first of all, you might actually palpate a fluid wave. You might see loss of cirrhosal detail in radiographs. You might see free abdominal fluid on ultrasound, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later. Again, abdominal pain, circulatory shock, uh, history of trauma, and then uh, a history of prior surgery, for example, a foreign body surgery or a previous enterotomy within the past week that they might be now uh, dehissing and not doing well from. So for an abdominal synthesis, you know, if possible, you want to empty the urinary bladder. And what the way that I do this uh, really does work well. And if you don't do it this way, you might just try this way the next time to see if it works for you. What I do is I take two one and a, one and a half inch 22 gauge needles. I shave the area and then scrub it with um, and use aseptic technique, and so I'm going to use some sterile scrub. And then I do what's called the Hawaiian punch method. And if you remember back when they used to have cans, those tin cans of Hawaiian punch, and you would use that can opener to open one side, and it wouldn't pour very well, and you'd have to put another hole on the other side, and then it would pour out real nicely. So that's kind of the premise that I use. Uh, when I tap abdomen. So I'll put one needle in, and what I do is I just use a needle. I don't connect it to a syringe. I just put the needle in and then just watch, maybe twirl it around a little bit, see if I see any fluid coming out. If there's no fluid coming out, then I'll put that second one in. And a lot of times, if there is enough fluid in the abdomen for you to get, which does, you don't need a lot, if there's enough to get, then using that method, once you put that second needle in, you'll actually start seeing some fluid coming out of the needle and out of the hub. And so then what I do is I take a little just one cc syringe and just suction off the fluid as it's coming out. Again, I do not attach the syringe to the needle because the actual suction is going to decrease your ability to obtain that fluid. So just let gravity help you kind of like doing a CSF tap, just kind of let it drip out into your syringe uh, or into your uh, blood tube. Um, so I do that. I usually do at least two quadrants. You can do four quadrants. And where I go and what the, the way that I position my patient is I put them in lateral recumbency. I divide the dorsal and ventral body with the linea alba. And then I divide the cranial and caudal body with the umbilicus. And I have a picture here um, where we have the patient's head to the left, his legs are to the right, and here's his umbilicus in the middle. And I split uh, dorsal and ventral here along the linea alba and cranial and caudal uh, right here. And this is where I'm going to go when I use my two needle kind of Hawaiian punch method. If I don't get anything, then I'll, I can go to these upper quadrants. But most of the time, if there's enough fluid for you to get, then you'll get it in these uh, two ventral spots in, on your patient. You can also do a diagnostic peritoneal lavage. Um, so in order for you to obtain fluid via abdominocentesis, there has to be at least 5 to 25 mils per kg of fluid. So if there's less than that and you really think there's fluid there that you want to obtain for analysis, then you can do a diagnostic peritoneal lavage. And the way that you do this is you place a catheter into the abdomen, you infuse 20 mils per kg of warm saline, kind of squish around their abdomen for a bit, and then you're going to put a syringe on the, um, on the catheter and pull out the fluid. You're not going to get a lot back out, but what you do get, you need to um, 
spin down and look at, um, again, I would say now that we have the availability of ultrasound, I've done a lot less diagnostic peritoneal lavage, but also if your patient is uh, really dehydrated or shocky, another thing that you can do is just give them fluids, resuscitate them with fluids, and give them a little bit of time because once they get more fluids, then you'll actually, if they have a peritonitis, you'll see more in the abdomen and you'll be able, be able to obtain it better. And this is just a picture of the catheter that I use for a DPL. And it's just a regular 18 gauge catheter, but then I take a blade and I just cut a few more holes in it so that, I don't know if you can really see these holes, so that you can uh, maximize the amount of fluid that you obtain in these patients for your diagnostic peritoneal lavage. So, what, so we obtain fluid, what tests do we want to run? What are we trying to rule out is the first thought. And again, the things that are going to be in the abdomen are going to be blood, it's going to be urine, bile, um, it's going to be septic effusion. So what can we do to this fluid so that we can rule out and figure out what's going on? So first of all, we can see if it's hemorrhagic, so we can do a PCV total protein if you do a diagnostic peritoneal lavage, a PCV of only 5% indicates hemorrhage, and that's because of the amount of dilution, because you put a lot of saline into the abdomen. Obviously, we're always going to want to look at, these, at the fluid on a slide, because we want to make sure that we're not missing a septic abdomen. Um, obviously, if it's during the day and we have people in the lab uh, doing fluid analysis and submitting for culture, if we think it's a septic abdomen, and then ruling out other causes, including uh, uroabdomen, so we'll do a creatinine or potassium. Uh, it used to be that we could potentially do a lipase on that fluid if we were ruling out pancreatitis. We don't do that as much these days. Uh, you do a bilirubin on the fluid or a glucose and compare it to serum levels so that we can rule out the presence of septic abdomen or bile peritonitis. Abdominal fluid glucose is actually a really great, easy test to do on fluid. There was a study done in, in Vet Surgeon 2003, and uh, what they found, and we've actually been doing this for a while anecdotally and it had never been published, but what they found was that if the glucose in the abdominal fluid was lower than the peripheral blood by more than 20 mg per de deciliter, it was 100% sensitive and specific for the diagnosis of septic abdomen in dogs. And it was pretty, worked pretty well for cats as well. So all you do is you take that fluid, you put it on a glucometer, just like you would for testing blood for glucose. And again, usually if it's a septic abdomen, it's going to be unreadable. It's going to be less than 20. It's highly, highly suspicious for a septic abdomen. If it's high or if it's the same as what's in the peripheral blood, it's, it's more unlikely that it's a septic abdomen. And I've seen that time and time again. I do this test a lot. Um, again, it's not the end all. I'm not gonna send a patient to surgery based on an abdominal fluid glucose. I'm also gonna look at the fluid, look at the patient, do some other things, but it is highly indicative. It's a quick and fast and easy test to do, and it can really start making you think that, oh my gosh, this patient likely or likely does not have a septic abdomen and that you need to get on them quickly, get them stabilized, and potentially send them to surgery. So some further diagnostics, obviously, abdominal radiographs. We'll talk about ultrasound, doing contrast radiography for more specific diagnostics, and then CT of the abdomen is possible as well, MRI and those sorts of things. We're not going to uh, get into that. One thing that we do all the time and that I highly recommend, uh, especially if you have uh, an emergency, if you work in an emergency clinic, is to get an ultrasound. And these days, ultrasounds are not as expensive as they used to be, and they are so helpful. We have one in our ER, we have one in our ICU, and we do what's called a FAST exam. And the acronym FAST stands for Focused Abdominal Sonogram for Trauma. It was first described in human emergency medicine probably about 10 to 12 years ago now. And what they found in humans was there are some specific areas that you can look uh, in human trauma patients uh, with an, an abdominal ultrasound probe where you can find free fluid. 
And unlike our patients with trauma, human patients with trauma actually, if they have free fluid, they'll send them to surgery. Um, but it does help us know if we have a trauma patient, is there free fluid? Um, because then we may want to do some more diagnostics. We're going to you know, be more concerned. Do they have a ruptured bladder? Uh, what is their PCV? That sort of thing. So there's four sites that are evaluated for abdominal effusion. Uh, and these sites are just called to the xiphoid process on the midline over the bladder and over the most gravity-dependent area of the right and left flank. And this is my dog, Gunther, and he uh, said that he would be fine if I used his picture. And so I did just to kind of uh, identify and show where we actually uh, put the probe looking for free abdominal fluid in these patients. So again, here's the xiphoid. You're going to look caudal to the xiphoid, midline right over the bladder, and then in these dependent areas on the right and left flanks. So uh, Dr. Soren Boysen, uh, back in 2004 out of Tufts, uh, published a study in JAVMA, and what they did was they looked at 100 dogs that presented for trauma, and they did a fast exam. So what they did was when the when the dogs came in, they had either whoever the doctor was, so resident, uh, intern, whoever, uh, do a, a fast exam, and they found that it was very quick. It took only five to ten minutes for a full exam. It had a very high sensitivity, so they did have some false negatives where they said they thought they saw fluid when it wasn't there, but the specificity was 100%. So if there was fluid, they were able to see it with the ultrasound. And that was compared to a boarded radiologist with a more sophisticated ultrasound machine. More interestingly, what they found in this study was that those dogs that had a positive fast exam, in other words, those dogs that had free abdominal fluid after trauma, also had higher lactate levels, higher heart rates, lower PCVs, and lower total solids. So really what they found was these patients were more critically ill. So the FAST exam, if it's positive, it's going to indicate a population of more critically ill trauma patients, which is going to be really helpful for our owners in giving prognosis and giving them uh, potential rule outs for what's going on and what we're going to be looking for and that sort of thing. Since then, there's been a couple of other papers that have come out. There's been a abdominal fast or a fast paper that came out where they actually scored the number of sites that were positive for fluid. And the more sites that were positive, obviously, uh, the, the worse those patients did. And also, there's a, a study that came out looking at thoracic fast exams or TFAST. Um, obviously looking for pleural effusion or fluid in the chest cavity, but also looking for that you can actually diagnose pneumothorax uh, using this method, although there is a learning curve and uh, it's a little difficult, but it is possible. And just a note as well that we use the AFAST and the TFAST, even though the acronym stands for trauma, we also use the AFAST and TFAST for other disease processes that are going to cause free fluid that don't have to do with trauma. So uh, these days, yes, we use the acronyms AFAST and TFAST, but we use them in all patients looking for free cavitary effusion, not necessarily just due to trauma.